thank you for being uh, so many here today with us to learn about citizen finance. Uh, my name is uh, Melissa Miklos. I am communication officer at FEDERN. But uh, today I am not representing FEDERN. I have uh, two different hats. Since this is um, a webinar co-organized by the Covenant of Mayors Europe and the c 50 EU project. And FEDERN is involved in, in both EU initiatives. So, uh, as most of you know, the Covenant of Mayors is the world's largest movement for local climate and energy actions, with now more than 10,000 European cities and towns who have become signatories. And signatory cities pledge action to support implementation of the EU 40% greenhouse gas reduction target by 2030 and the adoption of a joint approach to tackling mitigation and adaptation to climate change. Uh, so, um, as for c 50, this project is uh, funded under Horizon 2020 and aims to mobilize and support public authorities in developing, financing and implementing ambitious integrated sustainable energy and climate policy action plans. By the end of the project, which is next year, c 50 will have supported at least 115 sustainable energy and climate policy action plans at local level and developed more than 105 funding proposals for implementing these plans. So you can understand why uh, the two initiatives have decided to join forces. There is a, a lot of synergies here and it's actually not the first time we cooperate. Uh, if you would like to know more about, about these, uh, this initiative and this project, you see the website there. And if you are working for a local authority but are, have not signed the Covenant of Mayors Europe yet, don't hesitate to, uh, to do it. It's, it's important right now to pledge for ambitious, uh, ambitious goals at, uh, at local level for energy and climate. Um, so uh, this webinar is being recorded at the moment. Um, I will ask all non-speakers and speakers who are not uh, presenting to, to mute themselves. Um, we will uh, share the recording and the slides afterwards. And I also have my colleague Zaha here with me to help me take questions from the audience. We will each time gather a few questions after each presentation, depending on how we're doing with time. Good morning, Zaha. Yeah. Um, Good morning, everyone. Also, at the end of the of the webinar, there will be a, a Q&A session with all speakers. So, and in case we have too many questions and we cannot take them, you will have the contact details of speakers. So, um, you should be okay. So, I will also ask all non-speakers to uh, shut down their, their webcam. Uh, and now let's move on to the next slide. So you should have seen the agenda, but to remind you that we have uh, four main interventions here today. Um, first, we'll have IHS explaining to you the definitions of citizen finance. Rescoop is here with us as well. ICLE Europe and RIA North and the city of Krzyzewski, which is a Covenant of Mayors signatory. I will present them in due time when, uh, when they have their presentations. Uh, but before we start, oops, excuse me, uh, I would like to encourage you all to join us on Slido if you're not there yet, uh, to have some introductory polls to make sure everyone is here, awake and active. So please join us on Slido. It will be useful after as well to take questions as sometimes in the chat box when there are too many questions, it's not so easy. So if you use the code either on your phone or on your, uh, on your computer on the slido.com, now you will see our first poll. Very simple question, nothing to do with the topic yet, just to know where people come from in the audience. I will also answer it. Okay, I see people are already here, very reactive. Thank you for that. Belgium. We always have a lot of people from Belgium 
I guess, from the numerous EU networks. Quite a few people from Netherlands, Germany as well. Wow, even Kenya. I saw in the chat we also had somebody else from uh, from Africa. This is great. Let's wait a few more seconds to see if we have more answers. <laughs> Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for your reactivity. Should we move on to the next question, a little bit more related to the topic? Even India, Malaysia. Answers are still coming in and the number of participants is still increasing. I'm also working from Belgium, so hello to all my uh, fellows here in Belgium. Okay, let's move on to the next. So this is just to know if you have already some knowledge of the topic, some practical knowledge. I will also answer. Um, so most of you are normally working at the local level for a municipality, but not only, of course. We have, uh, as I said, some, some EU networks, probably some consultants, but uh, I guess most of you have the same aim of uh, implementing CEAPs and SECAPs at local level and advancing the energy transition on the ground at the local and regional level, maybe. Okay, so from the answers, I understand why you're here today, <laughs> because you're interested in citizen finance, but you haven't been able to use it yet. I think this is also very useful to know for, uh, for our speakers. And uh, yeah, I think all of them will be able to, to provide some information so that maybe as of tomorrow, let's be ambitious, or at least the, the coming months or years, you will be finally able to, to use this, these great tools from Citizens Finance to implement your uh, projects and your SEAPs and your SECAPs. We still have 25% who have used crowdfunding. I specified for sustainable uh, energy projects because of course crowdfunding is uh, widely used for other, uh, other things as well. 14% of participants have created an energy cooperative. And of course, there are other citizen finance tool, but in this webinar, we will focus mostly on crowdfunding and energy cooperatives because they're the, the most famous and uh, maybe the most relevant for local authorities. But uh, you will hear more about this from, uh, from our first speaker. Okay, it is quite stable as I see now. So I will close this, uh, this poll right now. And we will move on to the, the first presentation. Somesh and Catherine, are you here? Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm here. Great. Uh, is my sound clear, Melissa? Yes, I think it's okay. So I will just introduce you quickly before you, you start. Thank you again for agreeing to, to be here. Um, so the, Catherine and Samesh both work uh, for the Institute for Housing and Urban Development Studies in Rotterdam. Uh, and they're here today actually in their capacity of partners of the H2020 Prospect Project, uh, from which Federen is also a member, uh, because they have uh, developed a, a very interesting handbook on citizen financing. And uh, this will allow uh, you to, to know the definitions of the terms related to the topic from an academic and institutional point of view. 
So without further ado, um, I will let you start, Catherine and Somesh. Uh, I will first remove my webcam so we can focus on you now. Okay. And I will um, grant access to the slides to Catherine, right? I think this is what yeah. we concluded yesterday. Yeah. Catherine. Okay, you can okay. go now. Perfect. Thank you, Melissa. Um, very pleased to be in this webinar with these many participants. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Somesh Sharma, and I am working at the Institute for Housing and Urban Development Studies, Erasmus University, Rotterdam. I'm here with my colleague, Catherine, and in this session, we would like to share with you some of the highlights from the Manual on Citizen Financing that we have recently prepared for one of our Horizon 2020 projects, Prospect. You may also download this manual at the link shown on the slide. In the next seven minutes of our presentation, we will briefly talk about what do we mean by citizen financing, what are the different arrangements, and how do we actually organize citizen financing, how to choose a specific citizen financing instrument, and we will also quickly reflect upon some of the European best practices before we conclude our presentation. Citizen financing is sometimes referred to as public financing. It is an innovative financing scheme under which people or communities pool together their own financial resources to create a common good. What is a common good? In simple terms, it is an asset which is jointly owned by a community. A common good is non-excludable. Citizen financing is actually a traditional practice. We can find many examples of citizen financing from earlier times. For example, agriculture and dairy cooperatives. And interestingly, also sometimes construction of temples in India, where people contribute their money, land, material, and labor for building a temple within their own community. What we have learned during our study is that the citizen financing still occurs but as a practice and not yet as a standardized mechanism. That means when a community or a government is planning to use a citizen financing instrument for fundraising, they may come across several practical questions which are unanswered in the books. Among other sectors, citizen financing is also increasingly used in raising funds for implementing climate action projects. We found during our study that it is more widely used in renewable energy solutions and food security sectors, but it is not limited to only these two sectors. There are several forms of citizen financing uh, and there are different ways of organizing it, out of which crowdfunding and financing through cooperatives are the two most widely used forms of citizen financing in climate action projects. I would now like to invite my colleague Catherine to share with you more insights about these two specific citizen financing instruments. Catherine. Thank you, Samesh. Um, so crowdfunding and cooperatives share some common elements. They both use personal investments from citizens and cities, but in principle, they're gathered in different ways. I'll explore this a little now. Um, from our academic literature, we see that crowdfunding has three key components. Normally, many small donations are made, they're made by many investors and benefit many people. And they also genuinely use digital technology to promote themselves. Digital technology in this case refers to online platforms as they greatly help to connect citizens and the sustainable energy climate projects. An advantage of using these online platforms is that they can quickly and directly disseminate information to citizens and therefore quickly raise funds. They also reduce the number of agents or management groups so the decisions can be taken quickly and allow for rapid implementation. However, this means um, that often the investors are not, not part of the decision making process. Um, all things considered, however, they are well suited to short term um, projects. Cooperatives, um, however, in principle are funded. Uh, by investments from members and commonly through membership fees. 
the membership is voluntary and can include both citizens and cities. The members participate. Sorry to interrupt, Catherine. Uh, there is a background noise. I don't know if you can do something about it. I think it comes from your microphone. Um, I am not sure that I can uh, change my microphone at this point. Um, it, this sounds a little bit better now for me, at least. Okay, now that you speak, it's fine. I'm sorry, I moved your slide by mistake. Okay, uh, proceed. Yeah. I think it's okay now. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Um, uh, let's pick up where we left off. I was saying that. Um, bear with me one second. Uh, to round off cooperatives, that they're well suited to long term projects, um, as they've been financial overview or long term financial overview, um, as well as being flexible and resilient in times of economic instability. And this is partly because of the way they're constructed. They can simultaneously act as an association as well as an enterprise. Uh, however, there are some challenges, of course, with these practices. Um, I've highlighted some of the typical categories for challenges, uh, but more information of these can be found in our handbook. Um, but for now, I'll hand over to Sumesh, um, who'll explain the use of decision-making tools and how they can benefit. Um, if people trying to organize this assignment. Yeah, thank you, Catherine. Decision making is a very important step because there are several options and a, a, a who are organizing citizen financing may like to know which are really the suitable financing instruments. In our handbook, we have proposed two decision support tools. One, a decision tree, and second, a two indicator matrix. The decision tree compares various alternative financing mechanisms in one logical framework. Using the decision tree in our study, we have concluded that in case of small scale municipal or non-municipal projects, citizen financing and specifically crowdfunding is more suitable than other alternative financing mechanisms. The second tool is a decision matrix in which we have used two indicators, time frame and restrictions on expenditures. When we applied this tool, we have concluded that crowdfunding is more suitable for short-term projects, where financing through cooperatives is more suitable for the long-term projects. Now I'm looking at our time limits, and uh, I would like, Catherine, would you please take our presentation towards a conclusion? Thank you, Sumesh. Um, the logos on this slide are examples um, that we discuss in our prospect handbook. I can't go into detail about these now due to time limitations, but also the fact that we have the privilege to hear some wonderful examples after our presentation today. Um, but just to quickly note that from these examples, I've observed that there are several um, elements which make these best practices. Um, there's diversity of projects, really sound e economic, social and environmental returns, incredible engagement of stakeholders, both public and local governments, and they can also raise awareness and address barriers. And in some cases, this has led to transformative change. Um, so in conclusion, um, I want to say that the important message to draw from citizen financing is that although there is no real standardized definitions and it is a practice, this can create real freedom uh, for flexibility and contextual implementation, and the practices can engage both citizens and cities alike. Uh, this is shown in the best practice examples I've touched upon, and uh, I believe that it'll also be shown in the projects that the presenters will highlight after me. Um, crowdfunding and cooperatives are truly an innovative form of climate action, uh, a truly an innovative form of funding climate action projects. Now, I know this has been a big introduction in a small amount of time, so therefore I just want to finish our presentation by saying if you're interested in learning more, the prospect team have finalised the learning handbook for citizen financing modules, as Melissa had said at the start of our presentation. Um, this handbook can supplement what you've heard here today um, and with this presentation when we send it out there'll be some additional uh, slides uh, detailing how you can become involved in prospect but for now I've given you our contact details so please feel free to reach out and get in contact.
with us. And thank you very much. Thank you very much for listening to us. Thank you so much both. Sorry for moving your slides earlier. That was a mistake on, on my part. And uh, congratulations for uh, managing uh, on the time <laughs> imparted. <laughs> so now I will turn to my colleague Zara to check if there are some questions on Slido and on the chat box. Please remember that you can use Slido as well for questions. We will not display them right now, only at the end, but it's also easier for us to to uh, spot the questions. So, Sarah, can you can you speak now and let us yes. know? So it seems everything was pretty clear, Melissa, because so far we don't have any questions. Perhaps we will have some at the end of the, the presentations later on. Okay, great. Um, I, then I just have one quick question because uh, I will go back to the decision making tool, the decision tree. I think it's very interesting for all the, the local authorities that we have with us today. Uh, and I would like to know, um, were you able to, to try this with some local authorities yet? We did not, I mean, the, there are some demonstration projects involved in it and uh, we are still in a process of disseminating this tool but of course there were local authorities uh, involved in while we were working on these decision trees so i would say it's in the process at the moment but yes mm -hmm. local were involved yeah okay yeah this is thanks to uh, their input that you were able to build it but uh no one has been able so far to really start from from it but maybe this webinar will will be the occasion uh, so to our participants don't forget you will receive the the slides afterwards exactly. well sarah i, I yeah. see questions uh, I, coming I see, in I see quite, exactly <laughs> yes of course so we just got three questions now um four so the first one is from javier dominguez is the energy Co cooperative a formal company Yes. Uh, sorry, I didn't get the question. Is it yeah, in the is chat? The, is in the chat, yes. Uh, it's from Javier Dominguez. Is the energy cooperative a formal company? Yes. And uh, and the question is, uh, is crowdfunding conflicting with the public offering? Is that the, sorry, I'm just scanning through. Uh, in the chat. Could so you please? Is, is, is the energy cooperative a formal company? Is our energy cooperatives formal companies or not? Yeah, yeah. Cooperatives are the organizations. That's really the uh, the difference because uh, that's why we also mentioned why uh, cooperatives are more uh, suitable for long term financing because cooperative has a governance. So yes, you register cooperatives, but in crowdfunding. Uh, people just pool the money and hand over the asset. So cooperatives are registered governance frameworks. Yes. Good. Sarah, uh, maybe we can take, I think, one or two more. Okay. Yeah, so Shall I just... Um, yeah. Yeah. Shall so I just... From, from, sorry, yeah. so much. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> Sarah. No, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Yeah, so the, 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 ne ahead. the next question is from Piot. Um, is craft, yeah. crowdfunding concept limited by the amount of funds to be raised or categories of investors? Mm, that's a good question. Uh, because see, this is a practice, this, there are certain guidelines and mechanisms defined, but it does not limit the amount of the fund. So uh, by certain like categories of investors, it's, in crowdfunding, the investors are the people. So, uh, which means that it does not categorize uh, like, uh, I mean, it's okay. In crowdfunding, it's like building an asset for a common good and there is a no repayment. Whereas in cooperative, you take care of the revenue. So after an asset is built, it's transferred. So anyone who would like to contribute can contribute as as long as is the contributor is can be categorized as a crowd as a as a public. So it does not limit the amount and does not limit the category of investors. 
Um, I will just um, add on to what my colleague Samesh Naud said. Um, yeah. So it can be the public, but also um, cities as well that have been shown to also invest in pride funding. Yes. So there isn't um, any clear restrictive guidelines. Um, it is a concept that is open uh, for all um, investments. So both the citizens and cities um, we've seen have been able to invest. I hope this answers your question. Yeah, they're saying thank you very much for your kind response. I suppose that the answer requires examination of local specific regulations. True, that's true. Yes. And yes. something that we hadn't been able to really bring out very much within this, uh, the short presentation that we had yeah. is the fact that um, these are very depend regional dependent as well. Um, yeah. But back to that, the uh, two concepts um, are both so flexible, they can adapt to and try and negotiate with regional um, uh, industry or the regional um, context within that. Yeah, yeah it's he it, Pierre is very correct because that's why we uh, try to emphasize that uh, citizen financing is a practice. So it really very much depends upon what are the local regulatory conditions and specific guidelines. And that's why we say this is not a standardized mechanism. So it's not like a municipal bond or borrowing from equity markets. So this really is a difference. So I would say, yes, Peter is a very good, uh, rather uh, specific answer that it really depends upon the local specific regulations. Somewhere you may have uh, restrictions or definitions, somewhere you may not have. So correct is to check the local regulatory conditions. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, I think I will leave my colleague Sarah the difficult task of finding one more question. I'm sorry I told you we, we will have a lot of questions and uh, let's just take one more. Sure. There's another one from Mohamed Afik on the challenges, financial and economic barriers. Does this mean poorer cities or citizens would have problems? Um, perhaps lesser funds to pull? Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, sorry, Catherine, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Catherine. I know just to, um, to start that discussion, it doesn't mean, um, it's an interesting question and it is very, very good. So perhaps it'll be how you address that, uh, the socioeconomic factors within those cities. Um, I would say that it doesn't uh, mean that it isn't possible. Maybe you just have to think differently of how you address uh, the topic so you make it more attractive you really address those um barriers that we had talked about and that the handbook really emphasizes a lot more um that you really can um develop a a, a cooperative or a crowdfunding that can address some of those issues as well and um, so i would say no it's definitely not limited uh, but i wonder samesh if you have um anything anything yeah. else oh i, I mean an extra point sorry i think our our um the presentations afterwards will also show how we can uh, yeah. really reach every every group uh, but sorry smash yeah no i agree with you catherine however i personally believe that uh, of course Mohammed, if i try to make it black and white which it is not i would say in crowdfunding when crowdfunding is where people give their own money if people do not have money there is, uh, unfortunately, I can imagine there is a less probability of uh, raising large amount of fund. So it limits, it does limit. However, cooperative is like an organization which is allowed to uh, mobilize other financial resources as well. So if I could think of very quickly, this may not be really a good uh, answer, but my first impression would be in such a situation where I feel there is less likelihood of raising money from people. I might try cooperatives where I can pull in resources from other mechanisms as well. So that could be an alternative. Mohammed, not okay, sure if perfect. I yeah. yeah. I think that's already some good elements there. Um, thank you both. Uh, you have more questions maybe 
uh, you can actually answer directly uh, to the person in the chat now if you would like. Otherwise, uh, I'm reminding the audience that they can always uh, drop you an email. I can personally attest that all the speakers are very nice and I'm sure they will be very happy to, to answer to the questions later on. But unfortunately, we still have three presentations uh, to listen to and we really have to move on to the next one. So thank you again to Catherine and Somesh and we now move on to a presentation by rescoop.eu with uh, the coordinator Dan. Dan, are you here now? I am here. I hope you can hear and see me okay. Hope that works. Yeah. Uh, yes, everything seems to work well. Thank you. I will quickly introduce you for uh, the people who don't know you in the audience. So um, Dan was involved with the foundation of rescoop.eu and uh, Rescoop EU, I, sorry, I always uh, don't know how to, how to say it. And so he has been the coordinator of the association ever since. And today he will present you the activities of the organization. Probably you heard about it or you know what they do, but he will explain everything into details. And he will also provide uh, several interesting examples of energy cooperatives in Belgium for you to, to get inspired and to replicate in your uh, own municipality or region. Okay, Dan, uh, I will now give you control so you can show your slides. Here you go. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for the introduction and thanks for giving us the chance to explain you what cooperatives are about because the word cooperative is often it's often used in a different or in a in a wrong format, I think. And I, I think I will use this presentation to make sure that you all understand what a cooperative is about. Um, and maybe I will start with a few words on Rescoop EU. I hope uh, some of you may already have heard of us, um, but we're a fairly young federation. Rescoop EU um, was only founded in 2013. I was working on a European project, just like uh, the Sea Track 50 project, of course, um, where we got together with a bunch of cooperatives, and it was actually the first time in history that a bunch of energy cooperatives uh, who were operational. Uh, around that time, got in touch with one another and set up a European Federation. So we're fairly young, only started in 2013, but we've grown quite big in just a couple of years. Um, right now, Rescoop EU represents about 1,500 energy cooperatives and about 1 million European citizens living across Europe. Uh, back in 2012 and uh, 2013, we made an inventory and we tried to map all the existing energy cooperatives in Europe. And I tried to show that on the slide. Uh, you clearly see that back then we had quite a lot of cooperatives based in northwestern European countries like Germany, Denmark, Netherlands, Belgium, some in Spain. But in Central Eastern Europe, we didn't find or we hardly couldn't find any energy cooperatives. So we started looking into the main reasons why. Um, and one of the main reasons is that the word cooperative is still easily associated with communism. Um, that there was a general lack of support for producing renewables and therefore there was very low incentive for people to get uh, or to get familiar with these technologies and to start up an energy cooperative and there was also a general lack of financing, a general lack of uh, funds uh, for people to invest in renewables. So those were the main reasons why it was very hard to find cooperatives uh, in those regions, uh, especially uh, around 2013. Um, the good news is that this situation is slowly changing for the better. We now have uh, members um, with operational activities in Romania. We have members in Slovenia, in Croatia, in Greece. So the situation is turning out better now. Um, and with the new uh, legislative package that we have at the EU level called the Clean Energy Package, we get, well, we actually have very good provisions for uh, energy, what they call energy communities and which will also be an opportunity for local authorities to get uh, familiar with citizens and to make sure that they can team up and, uh, and, and, and take action at the local level to accelerate the energy transition. Um, the potential, we also try to see what the actual potential of community engagement or uh, European presumership would be by 2050 and it turns out that by 2050 half of the European citizens could become a presumer and produce renewable energy themselves, either by putting solar PV panels on top of their roof 
or by joining a cooperative. So the potential is quite big. Uh, I think if you haven't joined a cooperative yet, there's a good chance that you might join a cooperative within uh, within uh, 30 years from now. And so that's actually uh, quite some good perspectives we have. So words on the Federation, we have a few objectives. We are trying to make sure that we present the voice of citizens and cooperatives in the energy debates. Uh, we realized that that was unexisting back then. So it's the first time that citizens are being represented in the energy debate. And we try to do that within rest of you. We also foster international collaboration amongst uh, citizen energy cooperatives and we help them uh, to grow and prosper their business. And we also promote the cooperative business model, which is also one of the reasons why I joined today, uh, is to get you more familiar with the concept of a cooperative. Oh, that was way too many slides at a time. Former slide. Oh. That's done. Good. Some words about energy cooperative, because I already realized that there was a question about what is an energy cooperative? Is it always a is it always a business? Is it always a formal organization? And uh, I'm not saying that we are right in just um, the way we use it in our federation. So for us, a cooperative is a group of citizens who cooperate on energy transition projects. Um, and I mean energy transition projects, not only electricity, we're also talking about transportation, we're also talking about heating. Yeah. So it's just a group of citizens who are teaming up together and they are uh, taking on the challenge of uh, developing energy transition projects. What is important is that a cooperative or an energy cooperative is a special concept. It is not a technical one. Uh, cooperatives are often mistaken for microgrids or uh, energy islands, uh, what they like to call it. Um, and I must say, when we look at our network of 1,500 energy cooperatives, there happen to be some energy islands or microgrids, but not all our members are microgrids. There's a whole range of activities that our members engage in, which I get to in a sec. Now, what distinguishes a cooperative from any other business is not the fact that they have a cooperative legal form, uh, because in some countries, the legal form of a cooperative is unexisting. Like, for instance, in Denmark, they don't know the, the legal form of a cooperative. They rather call it a law. Eh? But it's actually the way of doing business. Uh, and there are seven international principles. We call it the ICA, the International Cooperative Alliance Principles. It's seven principles that distinguish a cooperative from any other organization or business. The first thing is that it, there's open and voluntary membership. That means anyone should be eligible to join a cooperative. It means it's open. It's open to anyone who feels like joining. Uh, the, it's not a private investment club. Everybody should be able to join. There's democratic control by the members, which means that uh, at the annual general meeting, the members get one vote regardless of the amount of shares that they own. So if you purchase one share or you purchase 100 shares, you get an equal say at the annual general assembly. So that means there's joint ownership in a democratic way. Members also join um, by purchasing a share. So they, there's an economic transaction. They, they, they become an economic owner, an economic member of the SOCA or the, the cooperative. Cooperatives always maintain their autonomy and independence, which is quite important since there's some big companies who are now setting up cooperatives themselves. We don't call them cooperatives because they don't have this autonomous character. So for us, the fact that it's a bunch of citizens who are operating autonomously is quite an important issue. Um, cooperatives also invest in education and training. They try to cooperate with other cooperatives and they have a clear concern for community. So those seven principles uh, really uh, distinguish a cooperative from any other uh, any other legal entity or form. And it's not a legal form because in some countries, the legal form is unexisting. There's a whole range of activities that cooperatives can engage in. Um, when I look at the cooperatives that have been operational in our network in uh, 20, well, back in 2013, I would have said, well, most of our members, and I think that's even the case today, most of our members are involved in energy production facilities. So it's a bunch of citizens who put in money together and they try to uh, make a joint uh, investment in uh, a wind farm or in uh, solar PV panels on top of a roof. 
uh, or they they operate um, a small hydro plant. So I would say uh, renewable energy production is by far the most traditional activity uh, that energy cooperatives are engaging in. But when we look at our members, we also see that we have cooperatives that are purchasing electricity on the market and that are just supplying the energy back to their members. We also have cooperatives that are uh, managing their own distribution grid. So they are grid operators. We have cooperatives that are combining different activities. So not only producing, but also trying to uh, supply the energy and also maybe trying to uh, operate a local distribution grid. So we call them microgrids. We have cooperatives that are dealing with storage. We have cooperatives that are dealing with demand response. This is a quite recent activity that we see coming up. And uh, there, there's often a good reason why cooperatives tend to uh, start exploring new activities. And one of the main reasons is that support mechanisms for renewable energy production have gone down in the last couple of years, which also forced these cooperatives to start looking into other activities. Apart from that, we also have cooperatives that are dealing with energy savings. Like we have cooperatives that are dealing with energy monitoring, trying to make sure that people understand how much energy they are actually consuming. Um, we have cooperatives dealing with uh, collective home re retrofits. We have cooperatives that are setting up collective purchases for LED, electric car sharing cooperatives, district heating. So there's a whole range of activities, not only electricity, but also transportation, heating, energy savings. Savings. I think cooperatives uh, can engage in any uh, project that relates to the energy transition. So it's not all, only microgrids. Sorry, Dan, and just to let you know that I think we're going a little bit over time. So if you could quickly go through will, one or two I examples. Speed up. Thank yep. you. Um, trying to go to the next slide. Um, so this is a, we're going to make a Belgian tour. Um, I'm based in Belgium myself, so is the Federation, uh, Resco PU. Uh, and maybe to briefly explain you what the most traditional business model looks like, I will use the example of EcoPower. It's also one of the examples that came back in the best practices report that we just uh, touched upon. On the left-hand side, you have a citizen who puts in money in a cooperative, in a legal entity. Uh, so he purchases one share, and therefore, he becomes a co-owner of one of the many wind turbines that the cooperative jointly owns, and the electricity that is being produced can be sold back to the member. Um, in Eklo, uh, that's a city not too far from the city of Ghent, it's based in Belgium, there's a collaboration between EcoPower and Volterra and the city of Eklo. And they, they teamed up and they set up a new legal entity, which is owned by the three, so by two cooperatives and the city, and the city decided to use the, the, the shares that they own to give access to people facing energy poverty. So the people facing energy poverty and who can't afford purchasing a share in the cooperative themselves don't have to do that. They get the share for free uh, from the city of Eco. So this is actually a way of how cooperatives can address energy poverty. Whoop. I have to go back to the former slide. Ostende is also a city in, uh, in Belgium. It's close to the seashore where a cooperative called Beauvau is teaming up with a city um, to invest in a district heating network. And there's also some public buildings that are now being heated with waste heat from an old incineration plant. So this is an example of how a cooperative can team up with a city um, on heating, district heating, which is also getting more and more um, popular. In Ghent, a city also in Belgium, um, the city where I live in, um, and I also noticed that Inner Ghent is one of the examples in the best practices report, um, there's a cooperative called Inner Ghent who is teaming up with a city, and Ghent is traditionally uh, known as a very old city. There's a very old uh, real estate, so the, the houses are quite old, uh, 19th century houses, and therefore there's a huge a renovation need. And so the city is setting up collective purchases for uh, installation material and they're trying to help people to take energy retrofits in their private homes. So this is a way of how cooperatives can engage with energy savings. Go to the next slide. In Leuven, we are helping the city um, to set up an energy, well, actually we're helping the entire province of Flemish Brabant, where the city of Leuven is based, to set up new energy cooperatives. And one of them is based in Leuven where we are helping them to set up 
uh, electric car sharing cooperative. Resco PU is also one of the board members of the Mobility Factory, which operates a platform that cooperatives can use to share electric cars in their communities. So this is an example of how cooperatives are dealing with transportation as well. Then I think I have a last example, which is Amel and Bullingen. It's in the south of Belgium. Uh, it's actually in the German-speaking region. I'm trying to go to the next slide. No, sorry, that doesn't. Um, Amel and Bullingen are two small villages in the German-speaking region of Belgium, where EcoPower and Courander, two local cooperatives, won a public tender and are jointly developing a wind farm, um, which will jointly will be jointly owned by the cooperatives and therefore the local citizens, but also uh, by the two cities. So this is actually a way of how cooperatives, citizens, and local authorities can set up uh, what will be called in the new uh, European guidelines as energy communities. And therefore, I think this is a model that we will uh, see coming up more often in the future. As a final note, I think it's important to emphasize that cooperatives are not just about financing, it's about taking control over the energy system, it's about democratizing the energy system, it's about keeping money in the local economy, um, and it's about disclosing profits to as many people as possible who are also facing uh, the projects. So I think those are the main key takeaways uh, from my presentation. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Dan. I think uh, the audience now has uh, uh, some idea of the variety of energy cooperatives that we can find and that they could start themselves. Um, and uh, I like the powerful message at the end. So, Sarah, maybe you can uh, let us know. I, I know there are many questions. Can you select maybe one uh, for now so we have enough time for the two other presentations? Yes, of course. So we have one on Slido from Gawain uh, on how does Rescoop want to uh, practically activate these high numbers of EU citizens to form or join energy cooperatives, except, for example, via communication campaigns? So we try to facilitate international collaboration. So that means our network currently exists of quite a lot of cooperatives and we see them as we call we, we call our methodology the trainer trainer methodology. It doesn't make any sense for a European association to go all the way to Romania to explain people how they should set up an energy cooperative. What we can do is share the experiences that are act or that are um, existing in our network and try to use those to actually help people and local authorities at the local level uh, to, to, to set up new energy communities. So what is happening in Europe right now is that we're democratizing our energy system and we need to make sure that people can learn from the examples that are out there and that they don't have to reinvent the wheel. And I think that is the main purpose of Rescue PU. It's making sure that cooperatives don't reinvent the wheel and that they can benefit from the experiences that all others have already uh, gained on all these different activities. Okay, um, sorry then, I think if you're okay with that, we will move on now to the next presentation, but of course we still have one Q&A and you will still be able to answer more questions uh, later on. Okay, yep. thank you very much, Dan. We now move on to Arthur. Arthur, are you here? Uh, we cannot hear you, but maybe in the meantime, I can already introduce Arthur. So he works for uh, ICLE, um, ICLE Europe, so the ICLE uh, European Secretariat as an officer in the Sustainable Resources, Climate and Resilience team. And uh, today he will show yet another aspect of energy cooperatives, which is, uh, uh, I would say, the, the more social aspect. Uh, and he will show how raising capital and acceptance for the local energy transition go hand in hand, uh, using a good practice example for from Germany. So let's see. Can you speak, Arthur? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Perfect. I will grant you control. And now you can start. Excellent. Thank you so much. 
Um, so hello everybody, my name is Arthur Hinch. Uh, thank you, Melissa, for the introduction. Um, so indeed, working for ICLE European Secretariat. ICLE is a global network of local and regional governments committed to sustainable development, sustainable urban development. And um, today's um, presentation, um, I'm going to connect to the previous presentation, specifically the one before me from Dan, um, elaborating on energy cooperatives, but elaborating on a very important aspect, and that is how energy cooperatives not only raise capital and uh, through citizen finance essentially, but also at the same time increase acceptance of the energy transition, increase acceptance at the local level. I will do two things. I will talk a bit more broadly about the concept of acceptance in this case, and then give a specific example of Neustadt and Waldnam County Energy Cooperative, um, where there is um, different municipalities who actually came together on a regional level and have formed a cooperative um, to just do to do just that to raise acceptance of capital. I must say here, of course, that um, I'm uh, and the, the cooperative was so kind to uh, give me permission to to present it today here in the webinar. But of course, I don't formally represent the cooperative. Just as a disclaimer. Um, should work. Um, I can't change the slide. And perhaps could you? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Um, so perhaps before going into the example of the cooperative, so just to share with you, or just to introduce this in a general idea of, of what about social acceptance? So of course you might all be aware that renewable energy projects, you know, to some extent are sometimes considered as a little bit of intrusive projects and in technologies, and especially with wind, but also in, in solar, for instance, there is cases of opposition to wind energy or to, to renewable energies in general. We have recently, within the framework of the now completed wind wind project, um, completed a guide, a handbook actually, on how wind energy can be made more socially inclusive. And in generally, we saw that there is a general perception that wind energy projects specifically, they're often carried by external investors, that the money doesn't stay in the local community, it flows out. Um, and that um, in order to change that, it's not only important to enable people to participate financially in the energy transition, but it's also in, in, um, important to make them feel part of the actual planning uh, phase, the siting phase, um, to really create an inclusive um, situation. Um, so when you look at this handbook, it's a very concise document, you'll see answers to some of these questions of how can it be made more inclusive, how can you bring people on board, and we see that it's important to increase um, the trustworthiness, um, to, um, to, to, to demonstrate a positive impact of that particular project on the local economy, for instance. Um, so just as a background um, for information, this handbook is out there and it explains, or gives very good examples from seven, seven European countries on how exactly this can be done and how it, how it has been done very successfully. So we see that acceptance is very important. And now I will show you why acceptance is so important for cooperatives as well and how they can facilitate it. So I will talk specifically about the energy cooperative of Neue Energie Invest um, in Bavaria uh, in Germany. And what is very interesting about this cooperative is that it is a cooperative of cooperatives in a sense. It is an inter-municipal cooperative between roughly 70 municipalities, which was founded in 2009 with the idea of creating um, of creating renewable energy projects that increase the value for not only one municipality, but for many different municipalities in the region, because there is a regional identity and they want to do it together. Um, the, 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 the cooperative um, is governed by three mayors, the governing board, and um, on the municipal represent representatives are in the advisory board. The idea is that every municipality uh, invests a share of 5,000 euros, um, and um, that that cooperative then maintains the up to 20 PV installations in one wind, one wind parks. What is very specific about this cooperative is that um, in order to allow citizen participation that live in the region, they have formed a separate energy cooperative called Bürger Energiegenossenschaft West, which is itself part of the first intermunicipal cooperative. And the idea here is that the overall regional sort of decision on where sort of um, in renewable energy plants, um, particular PV in this case, are, are situated is done on an intermunicipal level. But then citizens still have the chance to partake in, 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 in annual assemblies, to invest their own money, to support this project, to support projects that might be just around their doorstep. So this was the general idea. Shares for citizens start at um, five, uh, 500 euros. And they have reached up to um, 1,560 individual members at the moment. 
Um, so taking all of this together, they have quite a six, um, uh, quite an extensive um, uh, capital uh, invested, um, which reaches roughly 20 million. We've re heard in the very beginning that the the the, the, the entity as of a cooperative allows for um, for for um, sourcing of external funding. So actually, they cooperate with regional banks to increase this money. So the overall investment volume is, is actually a lot higher. Um, what you see here on the pictures, I think this very well demonstrates sort of this uh, interconnected um, and uh, sort of communal dimension of, of the cooperative. You see there the, the um, General Assembly um, of the Citizens Cooperative, that people from the regions come together and they do things together, they vote things together, they invest together. And there is no better example to, um, to, to, to show this um, then the following, you see the, the number plate from, from the car. So why is it called NEV, uh, Neue Energie Invest AG? This is because the regional um, number plate is actually NEV. Um, and so they decided that when, when, if they call the cooperative uh, in the same way as um, the regional sort of um, identification um, letters of the, for, for, for car number plates, that this increases the sort of regional Mm, coherence and that people start to associate themselves with this cooperative and this really worked. So I talked a lot with the 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 um the the sort of business leader here um of the manager of the cooperative and he explains that acceptance is definitely not a problem here and they all feel very much part of this. Um next slide mm -hmm. could you do it manually nice. Yeah, I, otherwise, uh, if you're not managing with the keyboard, maybe try the, the sc scrolling the mouse because you managed the other time, but if not, I can do it for you. Oh, thank you so much. Um, so there is another dimension, of course, and um, increasing this regional value. So and I titled this slide regional electricity, which is what they're producing, but then also regional spirit, because the idea is really that citizens and the municipalities together they produce the electricity on a regional basis and they all kind of identify with this. So what the NAV um, uh, Energy Cooperative has done is um, they have set up a regional electricity tariff. Um, they've not sort of done this themselves, but they cooperate, cooperate here with a um, licensed supplier, um, which itself is a subsidiary, subsidiary of a uh, German national um, green energy supplier um, in, able, in order to be able to um, offer to people from um, the region, be they members of the cooperative or not, a electricity tariff which sources the electricity um, that this, these energy cooperatives produce. So when you look down here at the, um, at the, 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 the picture, um, we see a very interesting example of how they advertise this, right? Um, they say, it says, we've, do, we've done it, we've become part of uh, the cooperative, but we also get um, electricity um, via the special tariff, it says Strom um, von daheim, which is which is uh, I can't pronounce it. I'm not Bavarian, but it's a Bavarian way of saying um, that's electricity from home essentially. And I explained that it's very easy to make the switch. So people actually take this up. Down here, you see the local um, football team, um, which actually on their um, on their in their shirts now actually advertise. Um, this specific um, electricity tariff. So even here, the business side of it, the electricity electricity tariff, serves to mm, increase identification and coherence, um, and um, yeah, makes it a very sort of uh, an initiative that everybody in the region really can identify with. Um, as Dan mentioned, of course, energy cooperatives engage in other um, activities as well. So um, just to mention some examples, they're currently trying to put one e-charging e -char charging station in every member municipality fueled by electricity they produce. Um, they engage in group purchases of pellets for this domestic heat and also they offer their members um, savings advice, energy savings advice at a reduced rate. And lastly, they employ local businesses, which is very important. And by doing so, um, they increase local jobs and income. And um, I've asked here again, how effective is this? It's very effective because as a cooperative, as a business essentially, they're able to do this and um, it, it, it resonates very well. Um, yes, and perhaps one last remark. So at the very beginning, it was stated that, um, you know, energy cooperatives are a company in this case as well. You know, they started in 2009 as a innovative initiative but now um, it's, it's essentially one full-time job for a manager and another job for, for um, someone supporting um, 
him. So suddenly you have to start worrying about not only the day-to-day -day management of the cooperative and the governance part, but also the finance and the business aspect of it, which I I'm showing on this slide. So it's really a company in itself that has to look for new projects um, and has done it very successfully in the past and is still continuing to do so. Um, so last slide. I am doing my best here. Mm -mm -mm. Ah, yes, thank you. So actually just wrapping up then. Um, so um, when you if you want to have more information on uh, this particular these particular cooperatives, you can click on this link. I'm, I'm aware that the that um, the um, slides will be made, made available. Um, if you want more information and more, yeah, how local governments are really carrying social acceptance on the local level, um, I would refer you to a policy uh, brief that we have written explaining exactly the role of local governments, why they're so important in, take, in, in, in taking up and upscaling social inclusive energy projects. And if you want to have more sort of very concrete policy advice of and, and five key principles for upscaling presumerism and collective presumerism in the European Union, I very much recommend you the um, this brief created by the Poseu project, which is another um, horizon project that we are engaged in. Yeah, so that's all from my side. Thank you very much, Arthur, for an interesting presentation showing another side of energy cooperatives. Uh, I directly go to my colleague Zaha to see. I'm, I'm pretty sure I saw a few questions on at least on the chat, Zaha. Yes, there are a few on the chat box. The first one from Tom. Uh, he's impressed by the German example, yet he wonders how to prevent citizen acceptance only by those that can afford the over 500 euros buy-in. Yes, thank you very much for this question. I think it's a very good question. I mean, in general, energy cooperatives operate by the philosophy that the buy-in has to be kept very low. So in this case, it's 500 euros. Other cooperatives have, and I'm, I'm sure my, uh, Dan can complement here, um, have far lower buy-in um, um, sort of hurdles. Um, 500 is still relatively um, low. Um, however, the acceptance, I think, in this particular case comes not only from the fact that people can buy in, it comes also from the fact that people identify with the cooperative because it has a very strong regional um, connection. Um, they offer this electricity tariff, so you can get the electricity that is being produced um, um, via this regional electricity tariff, even if you're not, not a member of the cooperative. So this also adds to it. Um, they're very visible in the municipality, and you know, um, and this is a, a key aspect. Um, but yes, of course, in principles, energy cooperatives strive to make the buy-in as affordable as possible. In this case, it's 500 euros. Okay, thank you very much, Arthur. Um, yeah, in the in order to keep time, we will do uh, as with Dan. So I will now move on to the the last presentation, but we can retrieve the questions afterwards. So thank mm -hmm. you very much. Now moving to Croatia, with uh, our last speaker, Petra Oerovatski. I'm sorry, Petra, for the presentation. I just say Petra. It's easier. Uh, are you here, Petra? Yes, yes, I'm here. Great. So uh, let me introduce you first. So, um, so we will first hear uh, Petra, Petra doing a presentation. She she uh, is working for the regional energy agency of uh, North Croatia. So actually, both uh, Petra and uh, and uh, Italy Europe, uh, not Arthur directly, but are partners of the C Track 50 project. I forgot to mention that before. And so Petra will present how the city of Krizevski has implemented the first crowdfunding initiative in Croatia and already carried out two renewable energy projects with this innovative approach. And during the Q&A, uh, Petra will also be supported by Lucia Topic, Topic from, um, from the city. She's a construction and spatial planning advisor. Um, also note, as I think I've said it before, but that uh, the city is a signatory from the Covenant of Mayors and the agency from uh, Petra, Rea North, is a Covenant supporter. So without further ado, I will grant Petra access to moving the slides. Uh, I just have to find you, yes, on the list. Here you go, Petra. Yes. Uh, good day, everybody. And thank you, Melissa, for the introduction. Uh, and thank you also for inviting me into this uh, webinar. Uh, so as Melissa said, my name is Petra Orechovacki, and together with my 
co-speaker Lucia, we will uh, present you the innovative way of financing renewable energy projects. Uh, in this particular case, the crowdfunding of solar roofs uh, in the city of Fijitsi. Mm, let me see if I can move it. Okay. Okay. Um, so while I was preparing this um, presentation, I researched a bit about the situation in whole Europe, actually, regarding the annual solar irradiation, as you can see here on the screen. And as I figured out, the Mediterranean countries like uh, Croatia, like uh, Greece, uh, Italy, Spain, or France, uh, are here actually in advantage when talking about the production of electricity and heat from renewables, uh, especially from the solar renewables, because the predominant colors uh, are here uh, yellow, orange, and red, actually representing the higher annual solar irradiation. But uh, here's not the case, because the city of Krizhets is actually in the continental part of Croatia. And uh, as you can see here, uh, it's, it's located here. And uh, on the picture, you can see the administrative uh, building of the research center and development park. It's the building that is owned by the city. And on this building, the Green Energy Cooperative installed the PV plant with the support of its uh, partners like the Regional Energy Agency North, like the Solvis, uh, ACT Group, Greenpeace Croatia, and the city of Križevci. But the most important uh, here are the uh, citizens who actually invest their uh, money into this project, and uh, this money will be paid them back with the um, fixed interest rate, which I will uh, discuss it on the next slide. So, um, let me see. Okay, yeah, uh, I would like to uh, just uh, quickly uh, show the role of each partners who are involved in this uh, project. First is a Green Energy Cooperative, uh, which uh, works as a representative of citizens, also citizen slash investors. Uh, Green Energy Cooperative also developed an online plat platform for raising money for the project and they installed a PV plant on the rooftop of the building and which they own for the next uh, 10 years. The second is, can I do it? Um, the second is the of Križice, uh, which owns the uh, building as I mentioned and they provide administrative and financial support in the preparation uh, phase and also grants an energy saving annual fee for 10 years uh, to all investors. Uh, then we have a Krizhetsi Entrepreneurial Center, which is the manager of the Development Center Technology Park building. And they actually use the, uh, the electricity which is produced, uh, produced from uh, PV plants installed on the rooftop of the building. And least but not last, uh, last but not least, uh, there are citizens who actually invest in this project. Uh, they lend money to the cooperative uh, who is paying them back with a fixed interest rate, which is uh, in this case for 0.5%. Uh, here are some quick information about the project itself. It began in 2018 uh, and it was uh, and the power installed on the rooftop was 30 kilowatts, which is approximately 147 PV panels. And the predicted annual production was 42 megawatt hours. Uh, and the total cost of the, um, the whole project was 31,000 euros, which included all the expenses uh, from the beginning to the end of the project. And this is how it looks like after the PV uh, system was installed on the rooftop. Uh, so when the, actually the online platform uh, opened, uh, 104 persons or co and companies were interested in financing, but the end only not only, but uh, half of them uh, inve actually invested in the project. Uh, and they signed uh, individually the contract with the Green Energy Cooperative, in which was stated that uh, invested money was uh, will be paid them back in 10 equal loans. Uh, actually, the money was gathered in less than 10 days, uh, which is actually a pretty huge success, a really pretty huge uh, success. Uh, the um, average, uh, average uh, investment was 500 euros, uh, and this is the building from the from the air, as you can see where it was installed. But actually, the, st uh, the story about the crowdfunding didn't stop there. In 2019, the second 
uh, solar power, power plant was installed uh, on the same model. Uh, on the building, uh, on all one uh, city's uh, building, it was city library uh, in Križevci. The power was the same, uh, also 30 kilowatts, and the total costs were uh, decreased, mostly due to the decreasing price of the PV panels. Um, then, regarding the second project, uh, actually it was even huger, ex, uh, huger uh, or bigger a success than the first project, because the 40 investors actually collected uh, the amount of money in less than 48 hours. Uh, and even though the interest rate was uh, slightly uh, smaller than in the previous uh, project, it actually didn't mind uh, at all. Uh, regarding the savings, uh, I just put a screenshot on the, of the website uh, where you can actually monitor the production uh, on a hourly, daily, monthly, or even, on, or even a yearly basis. As, and you can also see um, here circulated there are some environment equivalents uh, showing how much uh, CO2 emissions or NOx emissions or SO2 emissions have been uh, saved uh, by uh, producing electricity from this uh, PV power plant. Uh, and for the end, I would just like to maybe to sum up the whole presentations here that energy is actually in the hands of its citizens and citizens are ready to become a part of energy transition uh, since their interest in climate issues has grown and uh, obviously it should and it can be in, the, uh, in their hands. And for the end, uh, I would like to show you a promo video uh, how the Green Energy Cooperative actually uh, attracts people to invest in, the, uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this project. So Melissa, can you please... Uh, Yes, I will turn it on. Hopefully uh, you can hear, but as only a few people are from Croatia, worst case scenario, it's okay if you can just read. Mi u Zedzu već niz godina razvijamo i provodimo rješenja kojima unaprijeđujemo razvoj vaše lokalne zajednice. Bilo da je to općina, grad, otok ili kamp. Nas je u Zedzu 19. To su praktičari, aktivisti, mame, tate, zaposlenici ili vanjski suradnici koji već niz godina rade na građanskoj energiji. Ono što smatram osobito važno je u kojem postotku će novi i molje izvor energije biti u vlasništvu građana odnosno lokalne zajednice. I zato smo danas tu. Pokrećemo krafani kampanju za izgradnju solarne elektrane na krovu razvojnog centra i tehnološkog parka Križnice. Upravo ovdje, na ovom mjestu, građani prvi puta postaju ulagači u solarnu energiju. Model ulaganja u projekt funkcionira na principu mikrozajma. Građani i investitori mogu uložiti novce u projekt davanjeg zajma zelenu energijsku zadnosti. Na period od 10 godina s kamatom od 4,5% godišnje. Sredstvima od zajmova zadruga kupuje solarnu elektranu i postavlja je na krov razvojnog centra i tehnološnog parka, te za to dobiva nakladu od korisnika elektrane. Nakladna je fiksirana i jednaka visini predviđenih uštita u električnoj energiji u slabnih radu funkčene elektrane. Ista nakladna koristi se za pogled zajmova s kamatom svim investitorima. Ovo je prvi put da je solarna energija u rukama građana. Ovdje počinje građanska energija. Ali u ovome nismo sami. Podrušku nam daje Europsko odruženje svih energetskih zadruga, Europsko odruženje gradova, kao i brojne domaće organizacije. Nafta, ugljen, plin, uzroko u klimatske promjene i uništavaju okoliš. Uz obnovljive izvore energije mi više nećemo imati potrebe za posljednom gorivu. Ne trebamo više čekati. Mi kao Greenpeace podržavamo ovakve projekte zato što ovdje mi građani uzimamo stvar u svoje ruke i zajedničkim snagama uz proizvodnju čiste energije čuvamo okoliš i prirodu za našu djecu. Projekt Križevački sunčani krovi odvijenja je naša energija Križevce. U smislu promjene paradigme iskraka koje želimo da napraviti, a to je uspjenost na održavlje razvoj i obnovljaju izvore energije. U tom smislu grad Križevci daje potpunu podršku ovdje. Naš loto je energija u rukama građana i vi možete postati dio te priče. Priključite nam se i budite jedan od investitora u fotonaplonsku elektranu u Križevci. Ovim projektom započinjemo solarnu revoluciju u Hrvatskoj. Vreme je da Hrvatska više ne bude zajednja u Evropi u korištenju solara. Uzmemo solarnu energiju u naše ruke. Idemo.
and you can see um, it's very interesting because now you saw Rescoop uh, EU uh, logo because, uh, uh, correct me Dan if I'm wrong, but I think Zez is uh, one of your members. And, they are. Uh, and yep. Yes, right. And and this was also one of the examples from our first presentation. So, uh, oops. So everything is uh, is connected. Okay. Thank you very much, Petra, for this interesting and last presentation. I suggest now we we do as uh, previous uh, speakers, previous three speakers, and uh, we take one question for this presentation, uh, and then we will have the general uh, Q and A session. So, Zahra, can you select one question for Petra and for uh, Lucia? Uh, to the audience, yes, don't forget to you also have Lucia here today uh, directly from the, the local authority if you want the, the impression or the opinion from, from the municipality. Yeah, hello yes, to everybody. <laughs> okay, sorry. So we have a question from Sied Ahmed, who sees from presentations a good collaboration between municipalities and local cooperative organizations. So he's wondering whether there are any suggestions when such trust does not exist. Uh, it should exist. I mean, I'm not sure how to answer that, but uh, we had a switch in another new mayor came two, three years ago. And he was really keen on the energy transition and climate change in Križac, although we are really small, 20,000 inhabitants. And we had such a luck with Green Energy Cooperative that they approached us and said, we have this project, are you in? And uh, the mayor was really in and said, yes, of course, what, what can I do for you? So we did uh, help the financing the campaign like marketing wise and we signed the contract that was needed and all the financial and legal barriers what is a micro loan in Croatia and what are the limits and um, it turned out to be a really good decision also um, for the if you see it like in pol politics you can always say to a mayor this will be a good PR <laughs> if they don't see the energy transition it's, it's something really important so uh, we were really surprised by the the response. One Križevci investor said, "I want to buy the whole uh, power plant," and that was because we we want to reach as many as citizens and people possible. So we said the maximum per grant is uh, 1,200 euros. 1,200 euros, yes. So. Um, it is a really good story for us in the municipality and we are really grateful for such a cooperative and to work with us. So, I think we can actually take one more question and, and this one that you answered, Lucia, I think we can even ask them afterwards to the other speakers because I think it was a more general one. So, uh, so Zahra, maybe you can read the next one which is maybe more focused on this presentation. Yes, yeah, so uh, Piotr is wondering how the idea of crowdfunding has been promoted or applied in Kribeci and how citizens have been attracted. If I may, Petra. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it, uh, it was actually this video that had a good response. So it's visual and uh, pretty good to understand the concept. And we had open discussions with citizens in big halls and uh, when the mayor came and they the citizens saw we are uh, behind it also supporting that gave like another um, kick to it because the citizens saw oh, okay if the city is granting it then uh, we will i mean they don't know most of them don't know about green energy cooperative and who are these like people or uh, so uh, we had open uh, debates and the first one was pretty rough, like there were some difficult questions and uh, kind of negative vibe, but then the second one was really good and the video was good visual, so uh, you have to be in contact with people and we also as a servant, as an official in the city have to be a good PR to our um, friends uh, on coffees and everything, so yeah. 
Thank you. This, as a communication officer, of course, this part uh, is very interesting for me, but uh, this is something I also noted from the other presentations that uh, since we're trying to involve citizens, communications is uh, extremely important. Thank you very much, both Petra and Lucia, for being here today with us. And, oh, uh, sorry, I moved the slides. We will now move on to the, to the Q&A. Uh, the general Q&A with everyone. Um, let's see. I will try to activate this Q&A on the slide so you can see it. One second, please. Uh, okay, let me just show it here. Um, so, Sarah, I think, yeah, I was saying that uh, the, the previous question, I think we see it here. I think maybe the other speakers might have an opinion on this. Um, so, you can now all turn your webcams. Uh, so, Petra, Lucia, but also um, Catherine, Stomesh, Arthur and Dan for the Q&A session. Uh, um, sorry, Sarah, normally it's your role, but I, I was just curious uh, so to, to, to find out if, uh, if you agreed with this statement from uh, see it here on the screen that uh, sometimes good collaboration between municipalities and local cooperative organizations is not, is not there. So then what do you do? Um, yeah, thank you for this question. Perhaps I can start. Um, so this issue of trust is very important. This issue of trust, you know, not only is the basis for, you know, being able to carry out your cooperative or your business in the end of the day, but also for making sure that this can be done in the long run um, and that projects get to, to the planning phase in the first place. Um, so, I mean, connecting uh, to what was just said, so of course, it helps very much if uh, in a local community, if there's one figure, for instance, or a group of figures that are sort of heading um, the initiative and people that are trusted. So indeed, this example of the mayor is something that I can concur. So what we've also seen, um, also, by the way, also via the analysis of the Win Win project that I've um, shown at the very beginning, um, if there is, for instance, a mayor who is trusted, um, who sort of takes it upon himself or herself to take a project um, forward, um, to look for funding, to talk with citizens. Um, this has a, a tremendous effect, which should not be, not be overestimated. Um, the other aspect is um, the trust between um, all the other sort of stakeholders. So all of this, of course, for, depends on how well people know each other and how well people trust each other. Uh, I can tell you um, from what I understand from the example that I showed from Bavaria, um, they all trust and know each other very much. And this is because the people who are heading these initiatives and um, that are in the government, government board of either of these two cooperatives, they um, are known uh, for a long time in that region. They're very well connected. And of course, even there, it was a challenge because you have to convince different stakeholders, you have to convince different municipalities uh, to come on board. And then perhaps with regard to citizens, it's exactly the same, you know, whether this is with regard to establishing energy cooperative or whether this is with regard to establishing, building a wind park somewhere. If the planning phase is not done correctly, if real participation is not ensured, projects will have a very hard time, um, you know, being accepted and even getting off, off the ground. Um, and perhaps lastly, um, trust. So what you see a lot, specifically in larger projects and in general discourse, is that um, you have um, a group of citizens that are opposing to a certain energy, renewable energy project, for instance, a large wind park, um, and they're being quite vocal against it. Um, and then the general discourse regarding that is that, oh yeah, look at these protesters, we can't take them serious because they're protesting and they're against uh, them denying climate change or whatever. And what we've seen is that what really is successful in the end is if you provide if you if you listen to all opinions regardless of what their opinion is really and if you uh, you have to take into account the fact that people that are opposing of a certain renewable energy project might actually be very knowledgeable and very much 
located in that particular region and they might be very good discussion partners if you just have the right attitude at the very beginning and in the case where this happened it works so trust very important but how you do it that's most important thank you dan um so uh, thank you arthur sorry i was about to say that dan uh, i think has to leave in five minutes so Dan, if you would like now to comment on this, or if you had other comments from the, the questions, maybe you can go next. Well, I think I've already, I mean, first of all, I need to leave at 11.35 sharp. I have a wonderful daughter that I have to pick up from the crash and she will be hungry. So I think you all know what the threat is <laughs> if we don't, if we don't go up on time. Um, I share with I think in the presentation you will find my email. So in case you have any questions after this presentation, you can always get in touch. Um, and I think I already tried to answer some of the questions that came up in the Slido and also in the chat to the people directly. I think one of the questions was related to does the cooperative model in the energy sector only apply to Europe or are there are um, interesting examples uh, from, 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 from elsewhere, from maybe from development areas. Uh, we do happen to be European Federation, so therefore we know the European uh, projects best, of course, but we, we are also in touch with cooperatives from across the world. So there's uh, an international collaboration ongoing with uh, Cooperatives Europe, which is the European association representing local cooperatives. And so we're trying to see to what extent we can also replicate the European models in other parts of the world. We are now trying to set up an energy cooperative in the favelas in Rio in Brazil and we are also trying to team up with uh, local authorities in Myanmar, uh, so Burma, um, so there's definitely interesting examples uh, from elsewhere in the world, um, so get in touch if you want to get, if you want to, if you want to more information about these. And then there, I think there was also a, a question related to one of the things that I said during the presentation was that support mechanisms went down, I think I already answered that one. So I was really referring to the fact that since uh, renewable energy technology has matured over the years, I think a lot of uh, authorities uh, from across Europe have decided to lower their support for renewable energy production. And in some countries that goes through a feed-in tariff, in Flanders, uh, Belgium, that goes through uh, this, the system of green certificates. Uh, in other countries, they have a completely different model, which is uh, more like subsidies that people receive whenever they uh, produce renewables. So there's a whole variety of what I call support mechanisms. So I think overall support for renewable energy production has gone down over the years because the, the technology has matured and therefore it doesn't need any subsidy. It's already profitable, profitable enough by itself. Um, I think those were the main questions that I already answered. In case there's anything else, uh, do feel free to get in touch and to, uh, well, I mean, I, I will make sure that I answer your questions then. Thank you, Dan. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Okay. And uh, yeah, goodbye. See you soon, hopefully. Um, All right. Okay. Just to let you know all the participants that are still here and brave uh, please bear with us for a few more minutes if you can because we had a an extra let's say a tool that we would like to present for two three minutes but so we stay uh, with the the presenters for a few more minutes um, yeah I would like to ask uh, maybe we can ask the two more questions that we have here on the screen and then we can ask the speakers for their concluding remarks and yes please stay with us because there is an interesting uh, tool called combo bond uh, that we will present for two minutes because we think it's interesting for for local authorities um so um the, the question that i have here is how have you been dealing with financial risk management especially for certain payback schemes with high interest rates um so I guess this is more a question uh, maybe for Petra and Lucia. Uh, Lucia, can you please answer this question? Because I'm not really sure about it. Can you please, Melissa, repeat it? Oh, I find yes, it in course. the chat. So how have you been dealing with financial risk management, especially for certain payback schemes with high interest rates? Oh, our 
Yeah, it's very technical. Legal. I I really don't know. I wasn't even in this project. It was my colleague that left the uh, municipality. Okay. But um, we had a good uh, legal support within the municipality, and we double checked everything. And the cooperative also has their own experts on the. As I mentioned, what are the um, creation laws and regulations on micro loans what are the because the, we were also afraid as a city can we guarantee something like that we shouldn't take money from the citizens so but the cooperative can we had a good legal support that's all i i know do other speakers have something to say about it or should i go to the next question well, I can, um, if I may simply add, because it's more a question, if I understand, is to know who is exactly doing it. We are academic institution, university, we are not doing it. But I would like to highlight just above uh, the question, there is a remark from Mark, who is very interestingly mentioning different models, uh, hedging, equity, debt. So, well, uh, what I can say here, that there are different uh, risk containment approaches which you can adopt in your uh, financial model uh, but which one suits this particular situation in which context is it asked uh, cannot comment uh, upon that uh, so the only thing I can add is uh, the way Mark has suggested different models so you can adopt different schemes uh, for uh, building risk resilience in your investments that was it Melissa from my side Okay, thank you so much. Uh, then I think I will just take this one question because I think it's interesting and we will move to Combo Bond. So um, it's from Beatrice from IHS, so your colleague. Uh, would you kindly comment on management of the projects after they are implemented? To what extent do residents contribute to management? Uh, and anyone can take the floor from the speakers. I think this is something that uh, it's Arthur, right? You mentioned it. Yeah, I was about to speak, but then I was muted. <laughs> I was looking at him as well. Yes. Um, well okay, so maybe the, Arthur and then Somesh. Yeah. So the, the the answer to this from from my side is is quite quite short. So um, the cooperative um, that I introduced has a full time manager, um, and as well as another um, support staff. So they are really taking care of the day-to-day -day activities. Um, they're taking care of the government's aspects. So you know, making sure that there is a general assembly, that um, there is new members, um, that on an annual basis, um, in consultation with the governing board, there is a certain return provided, you know, given to 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 shareholders, to to citizens who are holding the shares. Um, they take care of um, the, the the business aspect of actually marketing the the electricity. Um, and seeing where new renewable energy projects, um, how they can be acquired given the current um, the German um, enabling framework um, for um, actually being able to 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 uh, to, to cite new uh, renewable energy plans. So all of this is a full-time job, uh, and even nearly two full-time jobs, I think. Um, so I think in this case, um, the day-to-day -day management is done professionally. Um, however, um, I think it would be good to hear from Daniel as well, but he's, he's gone. But um, in general, I mean, cooperatives, they do rely also on voluntary engagement. And this is one something um, which is a very nice thing because it allows the community come to get together and to you know, invest their, their time, free time, essentially, to cooperate, to uh, contribute to the management of the cooperative. On the other hand, this can also be a, a issue, you know, because not in all cases, um, is, uh, is 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 the expertise um, um, or or the time um, there? Not in all cases, the voluntary and people that dedicate the time voluntarily do have the, the resources to, to or the time to be to be actually be engaged. Especially since you know applying for a, a large scale renewable energy project um, in, in 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 on the auctioning schemes for instance is incredibly. Um, uh, bureaucratic process, and um, it, it, it really depends on how much time um, people are able to invest. So in this particular case that I mentioned, it's done professionally full-time, but that's of course not the rule. Yeah. Uh, so Mesh, I think you had a comment? Okay, well, I actually mentioned that I was looking at Arthur to answer this question because 
I understand Beatrice would also like to know what is the practice. Uh, in practice, how much uh, citizens are engaged in management? And I agree with Arthur's uh, explanation. Uh, what I can say, uh, simplify this, uh, when you set up a citizen financing scheme, uh, there are certain guidelines, uh, which includes uh, the disclosures, the assembly meetings, etc. But it is also up to the organizers if you would like to increase the involvement of the citizen at, diff at different stages. So, yes, and as Arthur explained it really very well with the right examples. Yeah. That's all, Melissa, from my side. Thank you very much. Um, now, if one of you have some very short concluding remarks, and then we will move on to this extra extra presentation, let's say. You mean each of us? Okay. okay. Well, only if you have something to add, of course, you, you don't have to, <laughs> but uh, I would just like to be sure that you, you express what you had to express today. Um. Yeah, from my side, thank you very much. Um, I think it's, it's it's very very fine. I see a, a, a big question just on the screen very briefly. What about the size of the city? So in this case, it's a smaller municipalities. Yeah, so the, the you know several thousand inhabitants per municipality. So it, this is not large scale cities um, doing an intermunicipal cooperative. So just something to keep in mind because it's easier on a you know in a on a, in, in a smaller scale to to create this trust and to create a, these kind of structures. However, this all just depends on local circumstances. But just you know to answer this question, all in all, I'm happy. Um, I think uh, you know the, the the main message is that there is this critical connection between acceptance, trust, and raising capital. And I think I hope that this example was able to to bring that across. Thank you, um, Arthur. Um, Thank you. And just from my side, I want to say thank you, Melissa, and all the participants and the wonderful questions. And I think these uh, presentations really show the interconnectedness um, of uh, citizen financing and how diverse it can be. So if you have any more comments or questions, feel free to get in touch with us. And I think this was a lovely uh, webinar to show showcase where you can start and, and how deep you can go. So thank you. And that's that from my side. I would just like to say one more thing. Um, we as a city have a good annual budget, so we could finance these 30,000 euros by ourselves in our budget line, and it's okay, but it's important to reach the citizens and to change a mindset uh, towards the energy transition. So that's important. Okay, then thank you very much, all of you. Uh, if you still have a few minutes, please stay with us because now we have uh, Alex Utar as well from Belgium who would like to uh, explain what Combo Bond is. Alex, are you here? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, please thank you very start. much. For, for those one still having a couple of minutes, maybe um, so Combo Bond is, is an innovation and basically what I was going to explain you in two minutes are the basics uh, and we are in pilot phase. So um, very happy to share the results for your next webinar. Um, but uh, by the way, thanks to, uh, um, to the Covenant of Measures, you have a sneak preview, a worldwide premiere. So it's the first time that we talk about a Combo Bond in public. So listen carefully. <laughs> um, so we started the combo bond with the, the following um, the, the, the following statement. So local governments struggle to access to finance this sustainable project. You all know the problem. Usual way to look at the problem is to attract more money. That's what we all try to do. But we have issues because we have public debt rules and off balance regulation mixing, making it difficult. So we started with another angle. How can we create more impact with the same budget, right? More impact with the same budget. And when this is done, you have created the, the, the you optimize your, your impact with the same budget, then you go to the next phase, which is trying to get more money. And to do that, we use citizen finance. So um, how do we do that? It's basically the same principle as a crowdfunding. You can apply this to crowdfunding. You can apply this to, um, a cooperative as well so it is not uh, basically new but what we do is to uh, use the financial instrumentation differently 
So step number one, we create a citizen green bond. You can use green bond with cooperative or, or uh, and so you know what a green bond is. Basically, as an example, citizen lends money to the government to finance eligible green projects like 2 million for energy efficiency renovation or a couple of hundred million for solar panels, just like we had some examples today. That's exactly uh, the case today. So we, you, the, the, the municipality release a green bond. And so this is what we do with our pilots today. The real innovation is the use of the interest rate. So this is the real innovation. So the government will pay citizens back with a variable interest rate instead of a fixed interest rate, which is linked to her behavior from your citizen, right? A, a citizenship behavior. So like, for instance, if the CO2 decreases in your city, the interest rate for citizen increases, right? So if CO2 decreases, the interest rate increases. That's the real innovation. And so the citizen are incentivized to reduce their own carbon footprint next to your project. Like for instance, they will use more green mobility. They will renovate their own houses because if they reduce their own carbon footprint, they will decrease the total CO2 emission over your city and they will get more interest. So it's a way for us to incentivize citizens behavior on the top of your project. So you maximize your, um, uh, you, the opportunity to talk with citizens. This is what we do. So on the next slide, you will see um, the, 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 the present, well, this is a financial slide. Um, and basically what we do is we transform, you know, you, you see that red line in the middle of the things that this is a reference rate that you might have with your bank if you are trying to get money to finance your solar panels, like 185 on 10 years. And basically what we do is transforming this red line into the green line. So we start below and we end up above. And the total cost of the green line is not higher than the total cost of the red line. But with the green line, you have an incentive to act on the blue line, which is the CO2 emissions, which you can't do with the, the red line. That, that's basically the, the ID. So where do we stand? And that's my last slide. Um, the, where do we stand? R&D is done, feasibility is done, governance is done, proof of concept is done. And we have two pilots in Belgium uh, running in June. Um, and, um, and well, that's it. You will have the results for, for next time. I think if you're interested to follow the project, uh, to raise your hand, to become a pilot, whatever, uh, just drop me a line and I would be happy to follow up. Um, and uh, well, that's it. Basically, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Alex. Sorry that uh, you had to, to go last and we lost a few uh, participants. Uh, I try to do my best to keep time, but uh, yeah, it yeah, is no. a topic that is so interesting for everyone. It is hard. Yeah, of course, indeed. But that will be um, one of the topics for next time, I think, the Combo Bond. I just dropped you the, the website of the Combo Bond on the general chat, chat so that everyone can um, can have a look at if, if you are interested. And uh, they will have your uh, your presentation as well available. So they can they can always send you an email. Thank Hello. you very much, Alex. And uh, thank you everyone for staying yeah, until right. the end. Uh, so yes, I know I'm a bit late, but uh, let's consider this extra time for the, the brave ones. Uh, and once again, thank you for, for our four speakers that were here today. I think we heard many interesting things. I think for those who are interested in energy cooperatives, crowdfunding and citizen finance in general, you have a lot to think about now. You had a lot of different uh, examples. And uh, I believe we tried to go further than the, you know, the basic things. Uh, we tried to show you that citizen finance isn't only about renewable energy. You, you have heard from Dan about energy efficiency examples as well. Uh, and citizen finance, I think the main message, what, uh, what I will at least take away from this session, uh, citizen finance is not only about finance. Uh, before uh, finance, it is about citizens taking control of the energy transition. 
and so uh, yes, this is what I will take away. I think uh, you too. I, I was glad to see that the chat was very active, that participants were uh, talking to each other, that our, my speakers were very uh, dynamic as well and active answering questions that couldn't be answered. So again, thanks everyone and uh, I wish you uh, a nice day and a nice week. I will see you soon for other Federan webinars. Goodbye everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you. you.